Hey, everybody. David Costello here, founder and CEO of Jetpack Workflow and host of the Growing Your Firm podcast. Today, we have a returning guest. It's Tom Wheelwright. Now, for folks that didn't catch the first interview, we're going to link it up. But here's a little bit about Tom. He, uh, tax and wealth expert, Tom Wheelwright, is a CPA and CEO of WealthAbility. He's a rich dad advisor, entrepreneur, international speaker, and best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth, How to Build Massive Wealth by Permanently Reducing Your Taxes. I was just uh, fanboying about the book a little before the show. I'm sure we'll get into it. And he is releasing his next book this summer titled The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. Tom is, a, is the CPA for Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and many, many other books, and has spoken on stage on every continent to over 100,000 entrepreneurs, small business owners, and investors. He's also the host of two popular podcasts, The Wealth Ability Show, Tom Wright, CPA, and The Wealth Ability Show for CPAs. Now, Tom talks a lot about uh, you know, items that you know, small business and entrepreneurs and investors can take advantage of. Today's interview is going to be all about, you know, what should we be doing as accounting firm owners to really kind of level up both our mindset and how we approach our clients and what we could be doing for them. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to say, Tom, welcome back to the show. It hasn't been too long since your last episode. Thanks, David. Always good to be with you. Love, 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 love your show and love what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and you came back on rather quickly and it was all about, well, Tom, you know, in his back pocket has been writing this book, um, Walk us through a little bit about the about the book, and then we'll transition to what accounting firm owners should be thinking about when it comes to really advising their clients. Yeah, uh, thanks, David. So, um, I started writing the book actually about five years ago. I had the idea for it, and it was really focusing on what investments the, the government incentivizes the most. But then during that time frame, we started have this big political discussion this big discussion in the media about the rich cheat, the rich don't pay taxes, the rich need to pay more taxes. And I thought, you know what? That's this book. The, this book really needs to highlight why the rich don't pay taxes. Um, that they are not, you know, it's not just loopholes. It's not, they're not skirting the law. Um, the, the, the challenge I have with this whole dialogue, especially from the IRS commissioner, is that, you know, all those rich people, they all have CPAs, right? They all have professionals advising them, which basically is saying that we are either stupid or complicit. And I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm offended by that whole idea. And so I decided it's, I, I have a voice and uh, I like to write. So I'm going to write the, I'm going to write the other side of it. And what the win-win wealth strategy does is it shows that while the government will always win, Okay, it's it's not a zero sum game. So the, the government can win and the taxpayer can win. And in fact, the government wins best and most when the taxpayer wins. So this is not about, um, you know, when you talk about what we should be doing with our clients, uh, the worst thing that a client can be doing is cheating. I mean, not just because it's, you know, unethical and, and illegal, but because it's, it's ridiculous that, you know, the tax law is 99% of it is a, is basically a roadmap to reduce your taxes. And plus the government, there are very specific items. We looked at 15 countries, David, in this book and um, actually have end notes for 15 countries. And um, what we, what we looked at was, is how, how do different governments do this? And here's the thing, they all do it. Okay. All governments incentivize certain areas and most of them incentivize very similar areas. For example, all governments incentivize business. That's number one, right? That is the number one opportunity. I mean, if you think about uh, COVID for the last few years, everybody's been working from a home office. Those who had a business got to deduct that expense. Those who were employees did not. Okay. What does that say? Well, it just says the government would rather have you have a business than be an employee. Well, you get to choose. And that's actually the, you know, the whole point of this is that you're a partner with the government. I mean, anybody who's ever opened their paycheck and looked at the stub and it says FICA withholding, you know, you go, who are these people that are taking all my money? Anybody who's, who's done that realizes that guess what? The government's going to get a, get their share of what I earn. The question is, am I going to be a silent partner with the government or am I going to be a, an active partner with the government? And this book is all about being an active partner with the government and doing things that are socially beneficial um, to the to the country and to the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's I, I think the 
the narrative that is most attractive to the general public is the one that's most sensationalized. So it's when you hear about these incredibly complex offshore spider webs of funneling money or crypto schemes or, you know, that's what makes the news and, you know, or, you know, going after corporate behemoths, you know, but I, I mean, even in your uh, book, Tax Free Wealth, you were talking about working with a client who's trying to essentially create some sort of offshore structure in which they were going to pay almost similar taxes. And you kind of took a step back and say, look, look, there's a lot of things just onshore you could be doing to save a lot on, on taxes. So I, I you know, couldn't agree more. You know, coming from the accounting firm owner's perspective, um, A, how do they start thinking about what are the opportunities for them? Because I think if they start seeing opportunities for, for themselves, they're going to say, oh, my God, we have to give this to our clients, right? And right. so I guess, what is the steps for them to start making a transition for this mindset of uh, tax advisory and, 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 and understanding this world? You know, honestly, I, I'd start with the win-win wealth strategy. I, I just think having a basic change in mindset that this is not a zero-sum game. It's not a win-lose. It can be a win-win. We have to start there because unless we are comfortable that, look, we can win at the game and not have the government lose. Okay, just because right. the government's receiving, here's the point, just because the government's receiving less taxes now doesn't mean the government's losing because they may be getting more taxes down the road, right? The government's making an investment. If you look at this, from uh, what I like everybody to do who reads this book is, if you could be the government, would you? Would you take the government's position in those investments? In other words, would you put that kind of money in in order to get those potential returns? And there's, it, with the exception of one of the seven, um, where, where the government really doesn't win. Those six investments, I mean, you would take that in a heartbeat, David. I mean, every one of us as investors, we would love that kind of return. Think about it. You get to set the rules. You get to enforce the rules. You get to judge the rules. And on top of that, you can never get out of the contract. I mean, this is such a powerful position for the government and they're going and they're the ones who are making the decisions right they're the ones who make the decisions about what's incentivized and and it doesn't matter by the way which <laughs> who's in the administration all all that matters is that different administrations incentivize different emphasize different things you know last administration highly emphasized real estate this administration is highly emphasizing um uh, renewable energy Okay, but they're still doing it the same way through tax benefits. So I, I really think the first thing to realize is there, there, there is a pattern you can follow for your clients. And once the clients see this, I mean, you've got to see it first. But once you see it and then you can pass it on your clients, I actually think um, Win Win Wealth is a really good book to be giving out to clients and saying, look, this is the way the tax law actually works. Um, here, you know, we, Tom Wheelwright's run numbers on both the government side and the taxpayer side, and it's a win for you, and it's a win for the government, so you don't have to feel guilty about it. So are you saying that the, the reason more firm owners haven't made this transition and or relay this to their clients is because there's this assumed almost guilt that you're cheating almost or you're skirting irresponsibility somehow is that the is that the biggest barrier for this being adopted more fully i think that's part of it because i i do think that a lot of accountants are afraid of the irs i, I think they're afraid of the irs and, and the reason they're afraid of the irs they they're not understanding that the congress is on their side okay congress is on the side of the taxpayer the irs yes we get that you know especially right now they're doing some things that i'm not too pleased with but as a general rule, the IRS, you know, you get an IRS audit, they're, they're coming in, they're doing their thing. And, um, you know, they're the auditor, basically. That's what they are. And auditing's not a bad idea, you know, to have your books audited once in a while. So it's not the end of the world. I think that a lot of um, accountants, uh, tax advisors, CPAs, I think a lot of people are, you know, very concerned about protecting themselves and protecting the clients. Oh, well, what if they do this? What if they do this? But if you look at at those things that the government wants you to do, you know, not don't be looking at the loopholes. Don't be looking for that fancy schmancy stuff. There's so yeah. much middle of the road that we're not doing. And, and here's the other thing to remember, David, is that one thing people forget is that 
if they make a lot of income, they're going to, and, and they spend it or they save it, they're going to pay a lot of tax. But if they invest it in one of these seven investments, they're not going to pay tax on that money. So you can build a lot more wealth and pay a lot more tax at the same time. Well, you know, the reality is, is our number one job as advisors is to increase our client's bottom line. And the easiest way to do that, frankly, is to reduce taxes because it's just, I mean, it's just not that hard. Um, I mean, this is what we do for a living, right? We teach CPAs. Um, that's my company, Wealth Billy. We teach other CPAs how to do this. And that's what we do. So it's, it's not that hard, it's something everybody can do. It's just a matter of getting, I do think a lot of it is mindset. And then, uh, then some of it is actually learning the law. So you do have to, you do have to understand what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've worked with a lot of CPAs and you mentioned the mindset is kind of the initial blocker in terms of starting to execute some of these great strategies, add these advisory packages. As a side note, I don't know if we're still talking about advisory services. You know, when I, we started building our software, everyone was talking about advisory services, but nobody would define them. This is just a, you know, you know, a, a, you know slap of the face. This is what an advisory service is, right? It's proactive. It's forward facing. Clients will pay more for it, probably a lot more for it, frankly, because um, their their minds in the future, they're thinking about savings or, or more income. And so this aligns perfectly with them. But uh, circling back to the folks that you coach and mentor, mindset's the big sticking point. Let's say they, 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 they buy into, oh, this is a partnership. The government wants to do this. They get a big ROI long-term because they're investing in whatever it is, housing, energy, uh, employment, um, what, what's, what's the next step? Like, what are the next, what's the next barrier for them to really start deploying? And if we can break down one or two more, so I'd love to, to kind of walk through this and give the audience almost no excuse to say, lean into this and, and go forward with it. Well, I, I, I think the next barrier is they've got to get out of what they're doing now. So, you know, I mean, what you guys do at Jetpack is so powerful because what you're doing is streamlining the the compliance process, right? And so you've got, to, you, you stuff to do compliance. Compliance is part of the planning. So you've got to streamline that compliance process, which is again, why, you know, what you guys do at Jetpack is so powerful. Um, and then you've, you've got to set aside the time. You've got to set aside time to learn yourself. You've got to sharpen that saw. You've got to learn the tax law. You really do need to learn it because you know, the, the clients, let's say, let's say your client reads win-win wealth strategy, or they read tax free wealth, they're going to come to you and say, okay, how do I do this? Well, you need to know how to do it. So for yeah. one thing, you better be reading these books because you need to know how to do this. But second of all, you better be getting the technical training that you need. And the, the third thing I would say is um, a, a problem that a lot of people have is they're too much of generalist. Um, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in um, a niche will make you rich mm -hmm. and specializing because you can't be good at everything. For example, if somebody comes to me with a pension plan question, I am not going to be the one to answer that question. If they come to me with an international question, I'm not going to be the one to answer that question. And I've been doing this for 40 years, David. So I, I know quite a bit, but I don't know those things. If they come to me that they want to do a reorganization, I'm going to have pretty general knowledge, but I'm going to refer them to a specialist. They come to me with partnerships. I'm in because that's my specialty. Okay. They come to me with real estate. I'm in. That's my specialty. But um, I would, I would like, if you're looking at the seven investments, for example, I wouldn't pick all of them. You know, right. don't be a specialist in all, be a generalist in all of them, but be a specialist in one or two of them. And, and then it's a lot easier to dig deeper and broader into that single specialty. Yeah, it's really about, I mean, I, I imagine it's the intersection of what really lights you up as you're going through the investment strategies. And so you're like these two, real estate or international, whatever it may be, there's, there's, there's sections here that might really light you up. And ideally, obviously, there's an intersection with your client base. Now, if you find something that lights you up and it's on your client base, you kind of have this uh, dilemma that's, you know, maybe you need to think about your positioning and go to market to either attract those clients or maybe shift things a little bit more. But you're in a good place where you're actually thinking proactively about your firm either way. Yeah, you know, David, I, I started as a real generalist. When I started my first firm, and I'd been at Big Four, and I'd been, been in a, a Fortune 1000 um, as, in their, uh, as their in-house tax advisor. So I'd done the big company stuff. I started my, my first firm, and it was like, 
I'll take all comers, right? I mean, that's the way we are. Yeah. What I've learned over the years is that your services become much more valuable the more specialized you get. And um, the reality is there are certain areas of the law that I love. I mean, I love, um, I love partnership law. I just, I do. I've always loved it since I went to grad school at University of Texas. I've loved it. And so what I do is, is I, I do gravitate towards those clients. So if, if a developer, real estate developer comes to me, I'm going, yeah, I'll probably take this client because I like real estate developers. I think I find they're really interesting. Real estate developers drive the, drive other accounts nuts because they're so they're like wild and woolly. Right. Um, so I, I do think that the better you define um, both your demographics and your psychographics, you know, what type of person are you looking for? Uh, I actually think you'll build your firm faster and you'll certainly be able to have a lot more fun, be a lot more successful and make a lot more money. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I've certainly come across uh, firm owners. I imagine some of them might be listening today. Now they come across these concepts. They are just on fire. Eye opening mindset shift. They're ready to rock. They want to provide this to their clients. Some of them might just start doing it for free because they're so darn excited about it. I don't know. But what do you see is the difference between compliance based fees to more tax advisory? Is it is it five xing the overall client contract? Two xing? Is it ten percent? Is it? I mean, how do you think about layering in this new service? I'm sure there's a spectrum of well, scale. So, so so let's look at how a client values your services. What is the client? What value does a client place on a tax return? Zero. Zero. Cheap as possible. It is zero. There is no value to the client. This is a necessary evil and that's it. Okay. They are not doing this because they want to do it. So they're placing a zero value on that. So why? I, I can't tell you how many times I run across accountants. They're, <laughs> they're selling the tax return services, tax prep services, and they're giving away the consulting services. You have it backwards. Yeah. Sell the consulting services, give away the tax prep services. Yeah. Seriously, if you're going to give something away, give away the tax prep services. Um, because, you know, sell what the client values and sell what's worthwhile to the client. I find that, first of all, it's a lot more fun. I mean, it's a lot more intellectually stimulating. Um, it's, uh, it, you can leverage the tax prep. I mean, tax prep is really easy to leverage. It's much more difficult to leverage the consulting. And yeah. so, uh, you, you get to charge higher fees. Um, I, you know, kind of a, a fun little, fun little tidbit, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I put an hour of my time up for auction at an event and, a, and, uh, it went for $5,500 and that was at a charity auction. It went for $5,500 an hour of my time. Well, my question is, why are you charging 120 bucks an hour? Why are you charging 250 bucks an hour? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Why, why can't you charge $5,000 an hour? Well, you can't charge it because A, you don't have the reputation. Okay, that $5,500 comes with reputation. And B, you can't do magic, right? I mean, for $5,500 an hour, an, an hour that, that person who bought that, um, who, who, who bought that hour at auction, they're expecting some magic. And the reality is I'm hopeful that I can give it to them. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, once you learn, I think you got it. I think it really goes back to what you always talk about, David, is you've got to have process to it, right? You've got to have a system for reducing taxes. You can't simply rely on your own knowledge and making a new decision on every client. You've got to start having a system for delivering those um, those, uh, those results. Um, that's what we do at WealthAbility. That we, we actually have a system for producing those results. And we, of course, we deliver that information actually through software to our, um, to, to our members. And that's how they're able to be successful and replicate that success over and over again. Because what you really want is you don't want success once with one client. You want success over and over again so that you get a reputation and then your fees can go up and then you can stop charging by the hour. You can start charging by the month. Yeah. And to what extent, you know, when firm owners go through these, the, the, the book of the materials, I mean, I imagine it's eye-opening for them about how to, you know, for example, bring their family into the business, how to own properties, the cash flow they're bringing in personally through the accounting firm of where to invest to kind of, you know, lower their own uh, uh, kind of tax. 
is, is there an eye opening there? Have you seen a lot of firm owners say, oh my gosh, I, I've been sitting on this asset. I, what, what am I going to do with it? You know, they're just thinking about the sale, but not all the ways they can invest at an advantage. Well, I hope so. I, I hope so. Um, I, I will say that I don't uh, ever recommend a tax strategy that I haven't done myself. I, I, that I made that a rule years and years ago. I just don't do that. I'm not going to do something. I, it's not that I wouldn't do it. It's that I haven't done it. Okay. So I think that we ought to be doing, we ought to be practicing what we preach. And, uh, and, and then it gets more comfortable for us anyway. Right. I mean, if you're recommending something to a client that you're not doing yourself, I'm going, God, that's like so risky to me, you know, for both you and the client, I'm going, uh, clients ask us all the time. So they'll ask our members, well, are you doing this? Well, we actually require our members to go through their wealth and tax strategy before they ever take on a client. Yeah. Because we need them to be um, uh, transparent and, and real with their clients. That's what clients want. Clients want somebody who actually is doing what they're doing is building wealth along with them. So tactical question before we wrap up, and I, and I want to let people know where to find the books and reach out to you. But, you know, you, you, you mentioned something about get your clients, the, the win-win wealth strategy, open their eyes up to, to this world. Uh, it got me thinking about, you know, what is the appropriate communication cadence to have a good relationship with your client? Maybe you are very compliance focused right now. So you talk to them one time a year ish. <laughs> maybe that's phone call. Maybe that's just through email and you really want to make this transition. Uh, I know there's maybe no hard and fast rules, maybe depend on the client complexity, but what have you seen work well just in terms of, you know, genuine good relationship building along with the advisory conversations? You know, I, I, to me, it's always about asking good questions, right? If, if you go to a, a doctor and you really like the doctors because they ask you good questions to determine how to best uh, solve your physical challenges, right? Or mental challenges. Um, for an advisor, I think financial advisor, same thing. So for example, we can ask, would it be helpful if uh, we were to take a look at your taxes and on a more proactive basis, would, would, would that be interesting to you? You know, we've typically done this on a once a year basis and you seemed okay with it, but would you like us to do more? Some of them will say, no, they just want the once a year. Okay. And they're probably the ones that eventually you want to drop off right? And let somebody else handle. Um, but the, you'll, you'll be surprised at how many say, I would love that. I've been, I've been waiting years for you to ask me that question. And I, I will tell you, uh, we have, so we do 200 inbound calls a week. That doesn't mean 200 people contacting us. That means we're having conversations with 200 people. Um, they're coming from some other firm. They're, these yeah. aren't these aren't people who've never had a CPA or an accountant before. They're coming from some other firm, and most of the time, they're coming because they're looking for somebody who will be more proactive. Somebody they go, I just cannot get my accountant to do anything other than what I ask them to do. So we've actually gone to the point where in now I also have a CPA firm. We in our CPA firm we start tax planning in January, and so by December we don't really have much year end planning to do because we've been doing that planning all year round. And, um, and we do it on a monthly fee basis. We don't do it on a per hour basis or anything. we don't even record our time anymore. Um, it's purely results. We focus on results and it, it's a very big mind shift. It's really hard. I'm telling you, it's hard for us. It's, it's a really hard shift to make, to go from input based to output based right? Input-based meaning hours um, versus output-based, which is results. You know, how fast do I get my tax return? What kind of tax reduction do I get? And, uh, and different clients are going to be different. So really the answer is ask them and just say, would it be okay if I asked you this? Or would you be interested? You know, make it, you can make it really light and gentle. And um, so that you're not throwing yourself under the bus saying, or, or you can, or you can fall on your sword. I've done that before and say, you know what? I've done a terrible job. I've done you a terrible disservice. I have not been proactive enough. Would you, would it be worth it to you? Uh, or would you like me to be a little more proactive? And, you know, would you be willing to pay for that? Because I, I can't afford to do that unless I charge for it because I charge for my time. Um, would you be okay with that? We've got to be transparent with them, David. We've got to be upfront with them. And we've got, first of all, though, we have to be upfront with ourselves. So until we can be upfront with ourselves, frankly, 
you know, all is lost. Yeah, well, I know we touched on this a little bit, but when you're talking about output focused, uh, are you, you, you know, it's the throughput of when something was done, it was the savings you were able to deliver to the client. Are those the things you're reviewing monthly? Because I, th I think in some ways people obviously want to track inputs for profitability. They also want to track inputs to kind of understand general capacity. So are you thinking about ratios, output ratios to help you understand capacity or is it client ratios to staff? Or, I mean, how are you thinking about that? We're, we're thinking about only output. So <laughs> input doesn't measure profitability. It doesn't measure efficiency. What, what, what's, what you can measure is what's my profit per staff? What's my profit per client? Um, you can measure those things very easily. What does that have to do with how much time you put in? Yeah. The relevant, right? Um, now it's, we're, we're so geared for generations. You know, we've got generational mindset here going on where we, you know, it's chargeable hours, realization. I mean, I was looking at the uh, AICPA's map survey the, uh, just the, the other day. And they focus on general, you know, what's your realization? What's your utilization? I'm going, mm, that was okay. That's the way we used to do it, but there's no reason we have to do it that way. No, other industries don't do that, right? They look at what's our turnaround time, right? That's yeah. important. What's our turnaround time? How fast can we turn around a tax return? How fast do we get back to our clients? How, how much do our clients save in taxes? Um, how much do we help our clients build their business. What are, what, are, what are we doing to help them with their KPIs, right? We've got to generate our KPIs, but our KPIs need to be focused on results, not inputs. Um, you know, we, we can always go back to, we know what our salaries are. We know what, we know what the costs are, but, but hours are not cost. Hours are not cost. You know, if, if I have two employees, for example, and I'm paying each of them $100,000 a year, and one of them can get their work done in 40 hours a week. One gets done, uh, it, can, it needs 60 hours a week. Is the 60 hour a week person more productive? No. In fact, I will tell you the 40 hours a week person is more productive because they're doing it more efficiently and they're being able to train other staff members at that efficiency where the 60 hour person who's spending 60 hours a week is training the staff to spend 60 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't recall if we talked about this on the, in the first episode, but you know, there's kind of a danger, I think, with the, with the input mentality, if you're saying, well, you're, you know, if you come into a firm, I think in many ways you will default to the average and mm -hmm. default to mediocrity. And so if you're coming in, you're doing something and it takes you 30 hours a week, everybody else is doing 45 a week, you're either going to be the black sheep or you're going to start ratcheting up a little bit and kind of follow their process, whatever that may be. You kind of have this decision to make. You know, do I want to be in the crowd or out of the crowd? And it could either cause internal conflict, strife, and, and tension for the owner to kind of figure this out. Like, oh my God, these other four, what have they been doing? If this person could do it at 30, I got to figure this out. And then you either have a change management issue where you're trying to pull those three into the 30 or the 30 just says, hey, look, this, I guess this is how we do it here. Nobody really cares. And we're going to be pulled up to the more inefficient way. And I think that is probably one of the most like insidious kind of underlying cultural challenges with that input because you're gonna you just have that class and once people find it hey this is the way we do it it's really hard to change i mean it's not impossible of course but it's just hard to change yeah i agree i i agree and what we want to do is we want to raise everybody else up we don't want to pull you know we don't want us to you know pull ourselves down and you know it's, it's like that uh scene in uh that tom hanks movie big right where he's uh he's starting that toy company and the guy's saying you're doing that too fast you need to slow down <laughs> okay, you're going to make us look bad, right? It's the same kind of idea. And I, I just, I've never been like that. You know, I, I'm happy to make, if other people look bad, that's their problem, not mine. But, you know, that's my rebellious nature anyway. Um, I just think what we ought to be doing is focusing on the clients. You know, let's um, not focus so much on the firm. Let's not focus so much on, um, you know, us. Let's focus on the clients. Uh, you know, our, our tagline at Wealth Ability is better clients, better practice, better life. It's that order. That order is important. Um, I think when you take care of the clients and you start focusing on the clients, um, I think just life gets better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tom, we covered a lot on today's call. If folks want to reach out, say thank you, learn more, pick up a copy of the book. What is the best way for them to connect with you? 
uh, either go to wealthability.com, which is our general website, or winwinwealthstrategy.com. Winwinwealthstrategy.com is the um, is the website for the book, and uh, it's um, it's uh, we're just launching it right now. So we'd love uh, we we think that this will be successful for you and your clients, and uh, and that. You know, pick up a copy and, and see what you think. We have a lot of accountants who are sending copies to their clients, their key clients, because they want their clients to understand that what they're doing is a good thing. This is a good thing socially. It's a good thing. Um, the government wins. The taxpayer wins. Everybody wins. Um, there's no reason for this to be. Uh, uh, there's no reason for either the taxpayer or the government to lose. Yeah, what a great idea. Think about shipping this to your clients. Love it. Uh, if you couldn't jot down all the notes, we covered a lot today. We talked about the advisory mindset shift. We talked about uh, we talked about workflow, of course, couldn't help it. We talked about output strategies. We talked about niching down and pricing. We talked about so much. You couldn't jot down all the notes. We're going to link everything up at jetpackworkflow.com slash blog, including the book. So jetpackworkflow.com slash blog. If you enjoy this interview, leave a five-star review. It helps us get the word out. And if you really loved it, share it with a fellow firm owner that needed to hear this advice from Tom. Tom, thanks again for coming back on. Thanks, David. Anytime.